Thank you, everybody, for attending. My name is Jason. I'm a staff member with the Louisville Historical Museum. Um, I'm really, really glad to have you here tonight. Uh, it means a lot that you came out to have a conversation, to hear some information about a very pivotal um, and important, but also kind of difficult part of Louisville's history. Um, I'm glad that we as a community, whether we're the Louisville community or the larger community within kind of the county in the area can have this conversation. Um, kind of a couple of things. Um, one, tonight, if you have questions, let me know um, as the talk is going, right? So raise your hand, you know, I'll do my best to kind of to, to answer it um, or to hear it. I will say that if for whatever reason, we kind of find out that you ask a wonderful question that is very complicated in its answering, um, I might just ask that we, we address it at the end of the talk. That being said, there are a few times where I might just ask a question, and I'd love to, to hear kind of the audience's thoughts on that. Um, I'd like to kind of keep things a little bit um, back and forth and engaged. As I mentioned, tonight is um, a fairly serious conversation, but um, for everybody who was, was here, um, you know, you're hearing this again, but the museum doesn't just do serious conversations. We also do fun things. A museum should exist to have difficult conversations about the past and to show up and play baseball like it was the 1860s. So we encourage people, if you're interested, to, to attend this upcoming event. Um, September is actually Louisville History Month, so we have a number of programs throughout the upcoming month. Okay, I have one more question for the audience before we dive into Prohibition, um, and that is how many people have read the article that this talk is based on? Okay, wonderful. Um, I will be covering some of the same content, although one of the purposes of these talks that we hold is actually to share more information than we could fit in a 2,000 word article. So I've got some new sources to share. The kind of the, the point, the argument will be similar, and I hope to conversation about that. If you haven't read it, we do have free copies back um, on the, the table behind the audience. Um, so please take a copy of, of our most recent edition of the Louisville Historian. Okay. I would love to know what people here know about prohibition. It can be anything. Um, you can even say it went in Colorado from 1916 to 1933. You can use the slide. Um, you can make a case for it being one of Louisville's most pivotal periods. But I'd love to know what people know. Yeah. I'm originally from, but baptized in the church here. Okay. Lived up uh, Jefferson. Yeah. Jefferson. Okay. And uh, one lived on Jefferson and Short Street. But the thing that was, really sticks with me, my grandmother, I, I'm Italian, but my, and yeah. my grandmother that lived here was uh, Southern Baptist English. Okay. And she is alleged to have chased the Ku Klux Klan out of her house with a broom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. They were in the 20s were extremely uh, influential. Our governor was a KKK. Oh, yeah. You're going to spoil the... <laughs> I've got a picture of him. No, it's fine. It's fine. We'll get there. Yeah. No, no, no. No, no. no. I was cheesy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've been coming back and forth to their allies. Uh, we live in Littleton, but uh, we come up here quite often. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we couldn't hear what. Absolutely. Okay. So we were kind of sharing that one thing that that marks prohibition is actually the presence and influence of the Ku Klux Klan, um, and that is that is in our area, that is in our neck of Colorado, that is in the entire state. Um, so yes, very much the Klan was around, and the Klan was. Well, sometimes in history it's easy for us to look back and be like, we want to learn about the Klan and the KKK in the 1920s. But we forget that that's not how life works, right? If we are living through a period, we don't just think about one aspect of the period. We experience all of it. So anyone living in the 20s is dealing with the Klan, but also with prohibition, also with major labor strikes, also with all these other things, just like we, we go through life. Um, so the Klan is part of prohibition. What other things, even just general things about prohibition? Prohibition, because I watched Boardwalk Empire, the television show. Love it. Yeah. So another um, 
another thing that we often think about when we hear about prohibition is organized crime, right? Al Capone, mafia, mobsters, what have you. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. I will say that's a great, that might be a great framework for national prohibition. It breaks down a little bit when you get to local prohibition because it turns out the Klan was the one doing the, the arresting. Um, yeah, well, spoilers. Um, so it's less about Al Capone and more about the KKK being awful. Anything else about prohibition? Yeah. Well, Colorado, every town in Colorado had a different prohibition date. <laughs> we'll get there, yeah, absolutely. Yes. And Longmont was dry forever, except a little town sprung up called North Longmont. Yeah. And Colorado Springs was dry, and that's why Colorado City sprung up. Yeah, yeah. So there was a lot of different ideas about the efficacy, or the, efficacy, the um, value, the importance of, of prohibition. A lot of communities were wrestling with, should we have alcohol? Should we not? Um, and those conversations, as we'll kind of talk about, were very much tinged by ideas about immigration, ideas about who counted as an American, um, ideas about morality. Not every conversation about prohibition, but many of them, especially at the policy and implementation level. OK, so real quick, and we're kind of going to move forward. Um, prohibition is at its fundamental level just about alcohol, right? It is about the criminalization of the manufacture, sale, and transportation of alcohol. And that leads to, during Prohibition, which again for Colorado, 1916 to 1933, um, it leads to widespread bootlegging, um, so the creation and the sale of alcohol, um, and in other criminal activity. I have this in quotes because we're going to be talking about criminality a little bit tonight and how we can understand the criminality of an act that wasn't illegal a few years before and wouldn't be illegal a few years after, and that was often um, it was often acts for whom the punishment was only levied against people that those in power didn't like. So the, the arrest or the, the prosecution of um, criminal activity related to bootlegging and prohibition was not evenly enforced, which is critical. We'll get there. OK, but prohibition, and we were talking about this briefly, uh, thank you for bringing it up, happens amidst two other critical developments in US history. One, ridiculous anti-immigrant hysteria. Following World War I, it was just a bad time in America um, to not be Anglo-Saxon, which is a, a created cultural idea, which basically means you have ancestry from England or Northern Europe. The other thing that happens at the same time, they're related but not the same, is we have the violent suppression of un-American groups by other groups like the KKK. So we have the rise of violent hate groups. So hate groups anti-immigrant backlash and prohibition all go together. And for our talk tonight, they help us understand how and why Louisville became known as an Italian place. Now, I want to point out that tonight we're talking a lot about Italianness, the reputation of, um, of Louisville as a place of Italian culture and food. Um, one, other people lived here who weren't Italian. Um, other people who lived here and were part of the story of Louisville who weren't Italian. And two, honestly, we're focusing on Louisville's Italian history here because that helps us understand the broader racial and ethnic history of our community, especially during this period. Um, some of you may have heard this article is and this talk is part one of a two part series and the next part is on Hispanic history during the same period. So the museum is still doing a lot of research on this topic. Check back in a few months. But the takeaway seems to be that while Louisville during this period sets itself on the trajectory trajectory for being Italian, Louisville's Hispanic population declines. We'll be getting you more information as we figure it out. Um, we're talking to a lot of wonderful community members right now to try to uncover some pretty tough history. OK, so prohibition. Now, we're going to run through some, some regional history. Um, as we pointed out, there's a weird kind of path to prohibition that our maybe county goes to. Um, so. Lafayette, much of Lafayette actually starts going dry in 1888. That is, you see real estate um, deals that include in the sale of deeds to properties um, saying, hey, if you, if you buy this, you can't drink. Um, that's not all of Lafayette, but that's much of it. So the conversation around prohibition and temperance and alcohol kind of starts in our region then. As we pointed out, Boulder is going to go dry by 1906-07 when they're kind of voting on things and talking about it. 
Lyons goes dry in 1908. Now, other towns have other histories. I stopped in 1908, one, because I love this little article, but two, because I love what happens in Louisville in 1908. Welcome to Louisville when other towns are getting rid of alcohol. This is Ma oops, Main Street there. It says second, but that's Main, and then we have Front Street. And on Front Street, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 saloons. Now, I would be remiss to not point out, as my colleagues have, have pointed out, that the train in Louisville that went from Denver to Boulder and had passenger service stopped long enough um, for people to get off, grab a beer, and get back on. So the 13 saloons were not only patronized by Louisville residents. Others came in and helped support this industry. Um, but while that's going on, while Louisville is decidedly not dry, there are conversations throughout the state um, about prohibition. And by 1916, the state does go dry. Yeah. I just wanted to point out the fact that all of those 13 taverns were on Front Street. Yes. Street. Yes. Yes. There were a few places one could drink on Main during prohibition, which was not legal. Um, we'll get to those in a second. But yes. Uh, yeah. So, so you see kind of a, a um, congregation of our our saloons here. Um, OK, so 1916, though, state goes dry. I do want to point out, this has been one of the favorite things I found. You can actually order booze by mail for four years before national prohibition kicked off. And then you couldn't, because national prohibition was in effect. So prohibition has a dramatic impact on Louisville's saloon economy in that you no longer can have a saloon. Um, a lot of business owners did. Um, you've got the Jayco saloon here. A lot of business owners did kind of pivot to rebranding as only pool halls or maybe selling soft drinks. Um, one of the points of this talk is actually just to let you see some cool pictures. Um, so we've got, this is the Jayco Saloon that was on Front Street. You've got um, John Balance Saloon. This was at the corner of Spruce and Front. Um, the Crystal Palace was on Front Street. Um, this is another shot, or this is a shot of a different Jayco Brothers establishment. Um, and then this is one of my favorites. This is the Louisville Beer Hall. You've got a guy who's just holding his dog in his arms <laughs> outside of a saloon. Um, I don't know if the dog ever went inside. Um, and then finally, I just I love this picture. It's been the main image of our article. Um, this is of Celeste. Um, this is Celeste Romano, or Celeste Romano, depending on, I've heard different names. Um, this was on Main Street. This is not technically a saloon in that it was a soft drink parlor or pool hall, depending on how you uh, branded it. Um, the calendar says 1921, and maybe I'm wrong, but this looks like beer, which is not allowed. Um, so not quite sure exactly what this story is. Um, but the takeaway is Louisville had a lot of saloons, and then those saloons were not allowed to operate openly. OK. But tonight's actually not necessarily about saloons. It's about Louisville's reputation as an Italian place. And what I would love to know is just show of hands, who has heard that Louisville had a reputation as an Italian place? OK, great, most people. And what, what are the markers of Italian-ness that you've heard, right? Like, why do you think that it had a reputation as an Italian place? Kolaches, blue, blue parrot, spaghetti. So we've got a lot of food, a lot of restaurants. What else? Anything else? Cat, OK, so we have strong uh, Italian Catholic presence. Coal mining. Coal mining, yeah. So there, um, Mining and kind of uh, extractive labor was definitely tied up into immigration. Bocce. What? Bocce. Bocce. Yeah, so we used to have tournaments, um, bocce ball tournaments. Maybe we still do. We still do. I, mean, I think, yeah, at La Festa. I apologize. Um, I haven't played. I would not win. So, yeah, a lot of things, um, you know, as people kind of, some of the first thing we heard was the blue parrot, right? We had about Itali or about 100 years of Italian food on Maine, not just with kolaches, but other kolache family-related enterprises. Um, but I want to point out it's not just, not just Italian food. Um, in 1961, the Louisville Times does go on record saying spaghetti is what puts the town on the map. That is, we start seeing people cultivate a reputation um, as Italian and also maybe recognizing that it's Italian food that is leading to Louisville's reputation amongst Colorado. Um, but I love this. By 1967, 
Louisville celebrates the opening of Highway 42 by cutting a giant noodle. Um, uh, that's a great question. I'd have to look at the article that I clipped, um, but assumedly somewhere near Highway 42. Uh, and in 1986, Louisville enters the Guinness World Book of Records by making a 938 foot long noodle. To be fair, it's actually, you can't read it, but it's a 938, a 938 feet and 11 inches. And I really want to know why they stopped there. Um, we've gone another inch and get another foot. Um, but all of this is to say, in the second half of the 20th century, Louisville was known as an Italian place, and Louisville was leaning into that reputation, right? They're actively cultivating that reputation. How long is a block? How long is a block? Is a block long? 398? I don't know. Maybe? I don't know. I'm not sure how long a block is. You stumped me, Gene. Um, OK. So Louisville's cultivating this reputation as Italian, um, as an Italian place. Um, but we're talking about prohibition as well. So one of the ways that prohibition, and this is kind of a, a roadmap for the rest of tonight's talk, one of the ways that prohibition helps Louisville cement a reputation as an Italian place is that the profits of bootlegging are actually going to be part of the economic foothold that Italian families, residents have in town. This is going to allow Italian residents to weather KK aggression. Now, I want to be clear here. We're looking back on all of this history from 2022, and it seems to be almost a foregone conclusion that Louisville will become an Italian place. That was not the case. It could have gotten differently. There could have been, instead of um, an Italian place, Louisville could have had an Italian exodus. People, families could have left. There were a lot of Italian residents in town by then. It would have been really tough. But nothing is ever set in stone. And when we look back on history, sometimes it's easy to forget that. Um, in fact, during this period, this is what we'll talk about next time, it seems like there might have been a bit of an exodus of Hispanic families in town at this time. Um, so things could have been different. This is going to be the only time I dive into something, well, this is going to be the only time I dive into national law, legislation, or policy. Um, but this is an incredibly important part of what is going to actually happen in Louisville, and it illuminates the conversations that are playing out amongst individuals in this community. So the 1924 Origins Act um, is passed in 1924. And it's an attempt to change and then to control the racial and ethnic makeup of the country through immigration law. It is one of the most pivotal, influential, and terrifying pieces of US law that's ever been passed. And this is why. This law introduces the quota system for immigration. Previous to this, the US did not have any quota systems. That was not how immigration worked. What we basically did was said, if you're from a place, you can either come here or you can't. Think of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Right? There were places that we said you just you can't come to America from. And then there was no limitation to how many people could come from other places that the US allowed in, that the US liked. Now, the reason that this law was terrifying and revelatory in terms of how it, how it was an attempt to truly control the ethnic and racial makeup of the country is that the quota system said you get to have 2% of whichever nationality um, is here. So they said, hey, if, there's, you know, if there were 100 Italians in America, you could bring in two. But it wasn't how many Italians or anybody that was present in 1924. The people who crafted this policy said the baseline is 1890, the 1890 census. That 1890 census is the last census you could use that was conducted before you had giant, an enormous amount of immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe. So that is the census when the, nation, or the national demographics would have allowed you to actually have more people from Northern or Western Europe. Um, so the goal here is actually to have a quota system that allows you to get back to an ethnic and racial makeup that people in the 1920s thought was better. Again, these are individuals who are going to be very associated with the KKK, who believe that proper Americans come from England or Northern Europe but it becomes US law. Um, I also want to point out <laughs> there's just broad exclusions. Um, so this law also says, hey, if you're not eligible for US citizenship, you can't come to America. 
um, which included anybody of Asian ancestry. So horrible law. Um, and in effect, it, it is not altered until really the 1950s or 60s. Um, so it dramatically alters how the US looks. It's also really, really effective. Um, we're going to talk occasionally about the Rocky Mountain American. That's the Boulder-based Ku Klux Klan newspaper. They're not great. Honestly, they make a lot of stuff up, but they're right in this. This is them reporting gleefully about how successful that law was in dramatically altering who gets to come to the US and who is going to live here. So they're saying that after the law is passed, we go from having 80% of all um, European immigration come from Southern and Eastern Europe to having that number drop down to 12%. Um, and then they say that Northern and Western European immigration um, actually rises to about 88% of total immigration in the US at that time. Now, I wouldn't trust these guys for, for their exact numbers, but this is what's going on. Um, this is why that law really is going to affect what the US could look like. But this is also why prohibition matters. Because if you're the KKK or somebody that wants to keep out people you don't like, what do you now do with the people who are already here that you don't like? The immigration law helps you, you know, control who can come in, but it doesn't actually help you control people who are already here if that is your goal. And to be fair, it was very much the goal of the KKK. The answer is this. This is a picture of a raid um, done by the Boulder County Sheriff who I, I have found no record of actually being affiliated with the Klan. Possibly opportunistic, loved to arrest Italian bootleggers and others for political points, but wasn't actually in the Klan. Um, if you're attempting to really ensure that the United States remains a place and is a place that people of Anglo-Saxon descent are in control, prohibition and prohibition enforcement becomes a prime vehicle for achieving that mission. I don't know how many of you ever had a chance to speak with John Madonna. He was a long-term resident here. Um, sometimes he was better known as Bug Dust. Um, and about a decade ago, a volunteer of ours, Pete Lindquist, was doing much of the research that I've been able to use. And he talked to John about what this period was like. And John, John said this. He said, in those days, and he's referencing Prohibition, he's referencing the Klan, they didn't want to lose control of Louisville. Which begs the question, who was they? And here we go. Um, so this is the Klan marching down 17th Street in Denver. Um, but the Klan, and we'll get to Louisville, but the Klan was, was everywhere. Um, by the 1920s, the Klan has seized control of much of the state. Um, and this is not unusual. Colorado was, the Klan was more successful here than it was in other places. Um, but Colorado was not alone. Oregon and Indiana also happened to be hot spots of Klan activity, um, as well as the US South. Um, so the Klan soon controls the governorship, much of the state legislature, um, national elected offices such as Colorado senators, um, and then a lot of municipal and county elected positions across the state. So we mentioned our governor. Um, here's Clarence Morley. Clarence Morley was in the Klan. Clarence Morley ran for governor. Clarence Morley said, I am in the Klan. Vote for me for governor. Then Clarence Morley won. The Klan was so popular and so accepted in 1925 in Colorado that you have open candidates. You don't just have people who are secretly members of the Klan. You have people who are in the Klan and um, who want everyone to know it succeeding. Now, Boulder County was also a hot spot of Klan activity within Colorado. We had the third Clavern in the state which is just a goofy but terrifying name that um, the Klan called their little groups. So if you wanted to form a group of the Klan, you make a clavern. Um, so the third one in the state um, happens here. It went Denver and either Grand Junction or Golden. I can't remember. And then, then Boulder. Um, and as I mentioned, they also had the only Klan-run newspaper, um, which, was, well, which remains a great historical source, um, albeit one that's pretty terrifying to read. The Klan's success was intimately linked to prohibition. So not only does the Klan want to, or do individuals who sympathize with the Klan want to use prohibition um, to kind of enforce their vision of America, they also very, very much can 
tie their success to prohibition. And then they, um, they end up benefiting from prohibition's passage. And this is how. They offered individuals who are looking around, maybe don't have very great views, and who think, hey, I want to do something about this not being a great, wonderful bastion of Anglo-Saxon heritage. Um, those people were offered through the Klan a chance to do something to fix these perceived ills with American society by helping to enforce prohibition. So the Klan, the, the paper, um, one of the things you'll see is things like this all the time. Um, but you have foreigners very much being presented as enemies to be subordinated, if not eliminated or eradicated. Um, the quote here, the destruction of our national character by alien mixtures and our national thought by alien thought tends to destroy democracy. The Klan very much sets themselves up as the saviors and the protectors of democracy. Um, and they set anybody not like them up as, well, those who are threatening democracy. So Klan's members, um, and I want men and women, um, there are women's auxiliaries throughout the state, um, they're going to furnish tips to regional law enforcement about prohibition. They're going to actually participate in bootlegging raids. Um, you end up with Klan's members who are deputized in Denver and then conduct door-to-door -door raids in immigrant neighborhoods um, just to find assumed um, bootlegging activity. Um, and they also pressure law enforcement to make arrests. So what you'll see is in the local or in the Klan paper, um, they will say, hey, Boulder County Sheriff, you better start arresting so-and-so or so-and-so, these you know, Italian or other immigrant groups that we don't like. If you don't, we're going to make sure that their federal prohibition officers go with you on the arrest because we're assuming that you're corrupt. We're assuming that, hey, maybe because you won't arrest these individuals, something must be wrong with you as opposed to these individuals just being innocent. Yeah. Did the Klan focus on anti-black people? So the Klan remains, so well, there, we're talking about two phases of the Ku Klux Klan um, by the 1920s. So the first Klan, right after the Civil War, they are um, primarily located in the South, and they are very much about ensuring that recently freed individuals do not get to vote, that you remain, or that the South remains a white supremacist place. The Klan in the 1920s does not stop being white supremacist. They are still very much anti-black. They just become equal opportunity bigots. They hate everybody. Um, so they have expanded who they hate, which includes now they're now anti-Semitic, they're anti-Catholic, they're anti-immigrant. Um, but they also remain, as I said, very much white supremacist. Um, the inaugural edition of the, um, the Rocky Mountain American has a, a creed, what we believe, and like go down halfway and white supremacy is right there. Um, so avowedly and unabashedly, um, yes. Okay. So we will get back to bootlegging, I promise. Um, I want to talk about the Klan here a little bit. Um, researching the Klan is, is, is difficult, um, but this is what I feel like we can say with confidence. Louisville was both victim and perpetrator. That is, we had people in town who had crosses burned on their lawns who were terrorized by the Klan. And we had people in town who it seems like might have done the burning. When John Madonna says they, people in town, what? we had people who were, it seems, were, were in the Klan and were Klan um, sympathizers. We, we don't know names, but what we've heard enough is that it seems like there were individuals who wielded some power in town who were you know, remember Madonna's quote, who were trying to retain control. Um, yeah, I, 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 we have, um, well here, okay. I, I strongly suggest that people check out a video that we created about a year ago now. Um, it actually uses two sets of sources. One, newspaper articles, every newspaper article that we could find on the KKK in Boulder County. And then two, oral histories that were conducted in the 1970s that were with people who remembered the KKK when they were kids. And those individuals repeatedly said, yes, there were people in town in the Klan. Um, so I, I would give that credit and credence. Yeah? Was the Klan um, connected in any way with the Smaldones? Um, it probably would have been the opposite, although the Smaldones typically, they're a little bit later historically. Um, the Smaldones were a crime family um, operating out of, um, out of Denver. 
Um, yeah, the clan would have not, the clan would have hated them, and it would have been bad. Um, they were slightly divorced, though, and kind of eras um, by time. Um, yeah, so I guess, I mean, we don't want to focus too much on who in town was in the clan. Um, we just want to acknowledge people here were. Um, that it would be impossible, really, to, to have as many people live here as lived here and not have people who were sympathetic with the Klan. Um, yeah. OK. So the Klan's around. The Klan is using um, prohibition enforcement to kind of try to control groups that they are not a fan of. I do want to include this as a quick caveat. Not everybody um, who arrests somebody for bootlegging is in the Klan. Um, that is not a one-to-one. -one. Um, not all law enforcement who are doing prohibition enforcement were, were part of the Klan. Um, I mentioned a, a few people. We, we have a, a dearth of sources here. Um, so what we have um, is a lack of a lot of existing physical copies of the Louisville historian from the time. So most of what we understand about um, the history of, of arrests on bootlegging come from newspapers that came from towns around Louisville. I will say, as a historian, it's really important to have internal sources and external, right? So to understand the history of Louisville, you need to know what people in town were saying, and then you also need to know what people outside of town were saying, and you compare everything. We lack most of the internal sources here. Um, but there were at least about 70 accounts of arrests, raids, um, or, or sentences for people who were in Louisville um, related to prohibition. And truly, and I would say, um, I would be really surprised if there weren't a lot more because we're lacking those, those Louisville time sources. Um, so all of those arrest reports appear in, in Longmont's paper or Lafayette's paper. Now, I'm not going to dive into all 70. Um, the article that we wrote covers some of them. But what I would really like to do is talk about a few to really kind of think about the ways that bootlegging and prohibition enforcement affects different people in our community. So here's our bootlegging rancher. Because I might be familiar with the Vara family. I mean, listen, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm going to say some names. I mentioned, though, the criminality is confusing here. This is not a conversation about ethics or morality. This is a conversation of people doing things. And I have chosen cases that seem to be pretty definitive in their existence. Um, right? And I want to, though, have these conversations because we're going to see the different ways that being brought up on charges violating prohibition could impact somebody. So the Varas had an elaborate setup. There was a hidden still under a trap door in an outbuilding. That trap door had a, you open the trap door and there's a 25 foot ladder dropping down. And then there's a walkway or kind of a buried um, chamber and then a large chamber that was 12 feet by 20 feet by 7 feet high. The whole thing was so elaborate that there was an air vent through a chicken coop. <laughs> Vara ended up under suspicion because uh, he ended up buying too much sugar and too much water. Um, so authorities were kind of clued into how much sugar one might need. If you have a lot of extra sugar, you might be distilling things. Um, I, I will say my opinion is that, yes, this happened. Vara was arrested. Um, but here's the thing that I think is important to think about with cases like this. And there were many cases like this, individuals who had elaborate setups that clearly cost a lot of money. These were people who were selling alcohol to others. These were people who were making a lot of money, assumedly. I, don't, I have no sources from Vara, and I don't, know his, I don't see his bank balance. Um, but because this is so in-depth, because there is so much money at play here, I am going to assume, and I think you can make the case, that VAR probably at some point had a, a cost-benefit analysis going on, right? He kind of said, OK, this, all of this, is worth the cost, but possibly also the risk of being arrested, right? Um, VAR is arrested, and he is fined, and he does get in trouble. His case couldn't be further from the experience of Tony Scarpella. So in October of 26, officers raid Scarpella's home, and they find a large quantity of beer. I have no idea if this is two pints, if this is several cases, what? It's just a large quantity of beer. So Scarpella 
is not charged with manufacture, sale, or distribution. He is charged with possession, which a lot of people in Louisville were. And to be honest, I still don't understand because national legislation, in, under national legislation, possession is not a problem. Um, it's, that, it's just the sale, the, the creation, and the distribution that people will be brought up on. Um, but you could get in trouble for having alcohol in Louisville. Um, for whatever reason, maybe the state level um, laws, and Scarpella's fined $100. So Scarpella is not like Barra, right? He is not making money off of bootlegging. He's just having some beer in his house. He could not afford the $100, and he has sentenced to 90 days in the county jail. Now, here's the difference, right, between within the community. If somebody who is bootlegging with an intense operation, making a ton of money, decides that you know, it's worth the risk, knows that they might serve prison time. That's one thing. But I'm going to assume if you can't afford a $100 fine, that 90 days in jail is going to really mess with your job, with your livelihood, with who knows, everything. Um, so that is another experience. Then we have Nick DeFrancia. So we mentioned how there were all those saloons, right? You can't own a saloon anymore. I want to point out saloon ownership had basically been like being a small business person, right? It had been a path, a possible path to economic success. I do want to point out saloons came and went in Louisville all the time pre-prohibition. So it wasn't a guaranteed path to economic success, but you definitely, definitely could if you didn't want to be a coal miner, perhaps try to open a saloon. Some saloon owners even still worked as coal miners. Now prohibition doesn't end the option of selling alcohol from an establishment. It just makes it way more lucrative and way more risky. So De Francia is arrested in 1921 for selling alcohol, and it seems like he was, and then he's a second offender. Under prohibition, if you're a second offender, your punishment skyrockets. He serves, well, he is sentenced to between one and three years in the state penitentiary. I'm not sure how many years he served, um, although by 1925 he is out, so two years after the 1923 arrest, he is out, and then he's raided again. There's a massive raid in Louisville, um, 11 different places. Um, and nothing is found in that raid, um, whether that's because the Francia just got better at hiding things, or whether it's because he truly was not selling alcohol at that point, I have no idea. Um, but we have another kind of aspect of the way that prohibition is working in our community. Um, and then we have Jim Kalachi. Um, so Jim is the brother of Mike, who founds the Blue Parrot. This is from the newspaper, so I don't know if it fully represents what law enforcement were thinking. <laughs> but the article says Kalachi is an unmarried, unnaturalized Italian, um, and he and his place have been under surveillance by the authorities for some time. The reason that the newspaper gives, at least, for him being under suspicion is not he was bootlegging. It's he was an immigrant, he wasn't naturalized, and he wasn't married. He's suspicious. Now, here's where it gets complicated. Like most of these people, Kalachi was clearly guilty. He had an elaborate setup, honestly, that although it was you know, within Louisville city bounds, rivaled maybe the Varas. Um, so he was bootlegging. The problem is he was doing something that people had been doing in town for quite some time. And to, to say that he's guilty is complicated. I haven't mentioned it yet, but I talked about it in the article. Um, we don't know exactly how uneven prohibition enforcement was. It's hard to know, right? It's hard to know how many people who were not of various ethnic groups being targeted were going to be engaged in bootlegging or consuming alcohol, but then were never arrested. If there's no arrest, there's no historical record of it, and so we really just don't know. But here's what we do know. The federal officer um, who was making rounds at the time, um, he was not a great guy, um, it seems. How many of you are familiar with uh, the KKK registers that History Colorado released? So History Colorado, a couple years ago, released these, these lists of people who were in the Klan that they have had for a long time. And they kind of agonized over what do they do with them. And eventually, they digitized them and just said, hey, here. We have this. We don't feel comfortable not sharing it. But also, the community of Colorado can figure out what to do with this. The prohibition officer 
who was making the arrest, who's in many of the articles on these raids, is on that list. He was in the Klan. And he went on record talking to a newspaper in his home state of North Carolina saying, hey, I wish the bootleggers out here who happen to be immigrants and who are pretty bad were like the good old moonshiners of the South who are upstanding Americans and just happen to be of Anglo-Saxon stock. He is the one doing the arresting. He is the one that the Klan is threatening to bring in if other law enforcement in the area don't make the arrest that the Klan wants. Um, so I do want to point out, I, I didn't include here, um, we have fewer but several stories of women bootlegging as well. So this was not just a guy's game. Um, we have some, well, I don't know if anyone read, um, but there was a, a Lithuanian woman, an immigrant um, in Lafayette who was arrested for having a suspicious raisin mixture. Um, people raided their home, and the, it sounds like they were just looking for something to, to find. Um, and then we had, um, let me get my notes. Um, so Ed Domenico's aunt, um, the family story goes, was, was bootlegging, and she used to get calls from the county sheriff, and the sheriff would say, I'm coming over. And that was her cue to hide the still and prepare the bribe. So there were individuals who were definitely, um, definitely not being arrested. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know what to do with that, I guess, to recognize that there was corruption. But I mean, again, it's kind of like criminality. What do you do with the, the legality and the ethics of this when it's clearly being influenced by things like the KKK? And I truly don't know exactly where to leave that. OK. So the question really, though, was for tonight and for the, the talk and the article is how did Louisville become known as an Italian place? We talked about some of this. Um, you can unequivocally say Louisville, so Louisville's restaurant industry, specifically its Italian restaurant industry, would not have been the same without bootlegging. When the Blue Parrot starts, the individuals who started, um, Mike and Mary Colacci, are not able to secure a bank loan for whatever reason. And they go after, um, or they end up getting a, a private loan from a, a regional business person, um, somebody living in town. Um, it seems like the terms of that loan, at least according to family stories, were, were less than favorable. Um, pretty steep interest rate, pretty, pretty quick repayment. Um, and the Blue Parrot was, you know, in its early years and kind of establishing itself. Um, so they take the bootlegging. Um, you know, they take the bootlegging out of the Blue Parrot. Um, there are stories of, of one of the sons of Mike Kalachi being on the street corner <laughs> as a, probably an adolescent having flasks in his pocket and just giving them out and taking cash. Um, all that is to say there were pretty complicated reasons that it seems like the Kalachis were resorting to bootlegging. Um, it wasn't just because they wanted to make a lot of money selling alcohol. It seems like they were looking for income streams within an economy that actually possibly limited their options, um, right? Regardless of kind of the complicated nature of understanding the Kalachi family's bootlegging, you can, like I said, you can definitely say that the Blue Parrot would not have existed without them making that choice, which means that Louisville would not have established its restaurant industry in quite the same way. Um, you know, the answer to this question is that, um, well, partly it's just, it's bootlegging, it's prohibition. It's, it's the sale that, of alcohol when it was illegal that Italian restaurants residents were able to do in order to, to really have a stronger economic foothold um, at the same time that the Klan was bearing down on them. Now, if we're talking about Italian um, history and Italian reputation tonight, the larger question for tonight and for our next project is how did Louisville end up with the racial and ethnic makeup that it has today? Um, and we're we're looking at the 1920s and 30s as a pivotal period in understanding Louisville's racial and ethnic history. We're still figuring out the details, but this is what I will say. It seems like, as I mentioned earlier, and as I, I want to kind of leave you with, um, it seems like while Louisville's Italian community was being targeted, was surviving intense harassment, one of the reasons maybe that Louisville ended up as being Italian was honestly because of luck and happenstance. Other groups that existed at the time that came more recently, that had less time to establish an economic foothold, that had less time to establish um, 
the population density seem to have been kicked out, specifically Hispanic residents in town. Um, we're still trying to figure out what the details of that were. But I guess I just want to leave people with my own unease. I just want to share it. Um, I don't really know what to do with kind of these, these dual things going on. Um, the Italian community does persist in Louisville. And we see from 1910 to 1940, based on our preliminary research, the Hispanic population going like this. So yay for the 1920s and 30s. Thanks, everybody. Um, this has been fun. Um, this has been great. I hope it was coherent. Okay, so I'll be up here happy to talk more.